What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Nerds and Suits. Today is a very special episode. Today, I am not interviewing anybody. Today, I will be interviewed by my partner in crime, my co-host, co-creator of Action Industries, Mr. Andrew Guy. We talk all kinds of things on this show, but he actually goes pretty in-depth talking to me about my history coming up, talent school, music, the white leather jacket, all those funny things from way back in the day. And of course, Andrew Guy is a stone cold professional, so he does a great job with this interview. A big thank you to him for doing this for me and uh, and bringing this to you guys. I hope you guys really enjoy this one. A big time thank you to Nicole Craffick for being an Infinity patron here in the Nerd Network. A big time salute and a tie straight to you guys. Stay tuned at the end of this if all of the platinum patrons and above would like to hear their names and check out patreon.com slash nerds and suits for all kinds of cool, fun payoffs and, and rewards and fun things that we offer here on nerds and suits. But without further ado, please enjoy this interview. And don't forget to comment after you're done listening. All right, guys, have a good one. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm good, brother. I'm good. This is, this is fun. We've been talking about doing this for a little while now and uh, I'm expecting some very inappropriate questions. I'm very nervous. I'll be honest. <laughs> very, very nervous. I, uh, no, this is cool, man. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you asking me to do this. And it's weird, right? Because it's like, um, I think it's probably pretty similar to when you were doing my interview where you're like, I know everything that I care to know about you already. Right? Like, for the most <laughs> it's part, nothing I want to know. Yeah, there's nothing I don't know about you that I still need to know. Um, but actually, I think it's it's cool because now it's it's almost like I can ask you questions that normally you'd be like, why are you asking me this question? You know what I mean? In this mean? way, like, why, are you trying yeah, to prove a like, point? Why, like, What's your game there, here? Are you dying? <laughs> like, <laughs> why do you want to know about my childhood? Um, but yeah, so I think I, I, legitimately, I feel like your childhood is actually something that we haven't talked a lot about in our friendship. Um, yeah. And I think it's honestly just because, you know, when you get older, you're, like, why do you talk about high school that much? Or why do you talk about middle school that much? Um, but I do want to talk just a little bit about you, you growing up. Because, like, I know, yeah. you know, I know you love magic. I know you love comic books. I know your parents got divorced. I know that your parents are still, you know, pretty friendly with one another. I know you got a brother. I know you got a sister. Like, I know yeah. all the, like, the, the, the bases. Um, but, like, I don't know. Was there a moment when you kind of realized when you were a kid that you were, like, a little bit different? Because I feel like we all, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, in, in yeah. a good way. Like, I, I think I had a moment when I was in, like, f I believe I remember in fourth grade talking to my friend Steven, and I was leaving school one day, and I was like, do you ever just feel like this is all bullshit? And he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, this is all bullshit. Like, this is so easy. Like, have you ever been challenged in class? Or, like, he's like, I mean, there's stuff I don't know. And I was like, yeah, but, like, and, and it was just, like, this massive disconnect. You know what I mean? Like, he just didn't really get what I was saying. Um, yeah. I think in that moment... And that never changed for me. And I apologize for the siren here. We do live in L.A. Um, right. But do you, do you know what I mean? Did you have that moment yeah. with? Yeah. Well, so I have like I have like a couple uh, a couple thoughts on it. So the first one is like the thing about childhood. This is like a, a real thing that you've picked up on. And, and Roxy used to say this to me all the time, that it was a little weird that I had so little memory of my childhood that it was she, she would always say that it's like a, sort of uncommon. And it never struck me as anything at all weird. It never seemed even like. I never questioned it, but I don't remember that much from my childhood. There's like huge stretches from my childhood that I just have little to no memory of. Like I remember the name of a teacher or, but if you were like, what, I don't know, like name experience that happened to you in the fourth grade, I would have to like rack my brain to be like fourth grade. Like, do I even remember what year that actually was and who that teacher even was or who our friends were, or what I even did? Like probably not like maybe, why? So why do you why do you think that is? Like why do you think that you have such a uh, disconnect from your childhood? Block. I have no clue. Um, it, my parents got divorced when I was ten, and I think I sort of like repressed a lot of the the way that it affected me. Like there was some some parts of it I think that showed. I like acted out in school a little bit, but hmm. um, what did that look like? <laughs> Uh, black fingernail polish and blue okay, hair. Yeah, yeah, like the blue. And, uh, okay, yeah, because that was the other thing I was thinking about. I was thinking about you in the shower today, <laughs> um, and and I was like, I wonder if Ben and I would have been friends growing up. Probably not, because like no. you had blue hair and black nails, and like I was so straight, like sh straight at. I mean, you're in fucking middle school, so it's like <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You do anything anyway. But like, you would have just been like. A, like a emo kid or like a scene kid or whatever as opposed to me just being like i was pretty just like asian like 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 a like a, a asian kid in a white like salem i just like existed i didn't really have an identity i just like i didn't really know what was what yet you know what i mean like i just yeah. existed i showed up to first day of seventh grade 
and uh, I had gotten the, it was either the first day or it was really early in the year and I had dyed my hair blue. And I think I already had been started. I had started to already do the fingernail polish, the black the, and writing on my arms to a Sharpie and shit. Like I was, the, I was that kid, but I can't remember if I started doing that later, but I remember I showed up with blue hair. It was a big thing. And I, I was kind of like a chubby kid. Like I wasn't like, I didn't, I, I didn't get like tall and understand how to dress or anything until I was older. So I was like yeah. this, just like chubby kid with a retainer and like a bowl cut that like dyed my hair blue. And, uh, and I like parted it like Jonathan Taylor Thomas. And I showed up to school and this guy, Sam Miller, who was like the end of sixth grade, he was like my best friend. We were like really close, but he was a total like cool kid. He was like a mm. cool, like middle school, cool kid. Um, I remember I walked up to him and he was in, there was in the hallway and he, he looked oh, no. at me and he said, you're an F homophobic slur. Which I'm not going to say on the show. Mm. Uh, we can't be friends anymore. And, wow. and he said it matter of factly. And, and it was like, that was it. We, he and I were like we existed in school together but like we weren't like friends anymore. And uh, cause that's like how it works when you're that age. If you're really yeah. insecure or you're yeah, scared yeah. of being judged, you like, and I was a weirdo. I just like wanted to do what I wanted to do. Uh, years later, like a couple years ago, I got an Instagram message from him apologizing for treating me like shit in middle school. And uh, like 15 years later or something like that, or longer, even almost, you know, 18 it's years. Weird how that sticks with like with both of you, right? Like yeah, in very, yeah. very different ways. Like I bet that's a moment in his life where he looks back on, he's just like, damn dude, I wish, I wish I was just a little better in that moment, but you're a kid, yeah. you know, so you can't yeah. really do anything about it. Um, all right. So then, so like, when did you start to find like your, cause I know that you moved out here way before I did, but like from this age of blue hair and black fingernails to, I like, cause you're a pretty good looking, like I'm going to model and move to LA and like sure, yeah. hair's long and wear leather jackets and like, I'm going to be a singer. So like, <laughs> yeah. when, when did that moment happen of, of, you know, black nails, blue hair to like, I think music is maybe my thing. Cause it's hard for people to ever find their thing in life. And like, I, I'm assuming you must've found it or at least somewhat found it like pretty early on. It connects to the thing you asked a second ago about like, when did you sort of realize that maybe you were a little weird or a little different or just yeah. like, and, and for me, there was the, there was a whole period of time where like, I was a normal kid, parents got divorced, kind of weird, blue hair. And then I got into hair metal and mm -hmm. my older brother got me into it as kind of a joke. And I've told this story before, but he, he like had this friend in college named Dave who was really into like hair metal. And this would have been like 2001 or 2002. So it was less like now hair metal like the shit that i like is like classic rock for most people bon jovi is considered classic rock now yeah right yeah, yeah, yeah. but at the time bon jovi had had his big hits just a decade earlier a little more than that like so he was just kind of lame it was kind of like nickelback is right now like just just like 15 to 20 years but like still in the zeitgeist people would still say the name and just lame and right. his friend loved this stuff and so he had a band in college uh dave did called Excalibur, the gods of rock. And they all had, they all had, and he took it, they took it seriously. They wore like yeah, spandex to the gym. They like did hard drugs because they like wanted to be like these guys. <laughs> and they like, they wrote like ridiculous songs and they would like, they all had sweet names too. Like the singer was McVon Von Turnpike. The drummer, or the, the guitar player was Jake K.R. Steed Morgensteed, which is one of my favorites. I, I remember all these names because my brother told me and I thought it was like the sweetest thing in the world. I, and he was, wow. he like thought it was cool. But more like in a funny when you're 21, like this yeah, is my friend yeah. in college. Like, cool. Do this thing. Yeah. And it's, it's stupid, but it's hilarious and awesome. And I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever heard of in my entire life. And my older brother's my idol. So I'm going to learn to sing like these guys. I'm going to start taking singing lessons and I'm going to and I'm going to get into this shit. So my earliest band was called Last Action Hero. Um, that was the first there was one that I like, like early before that called like the Decepticons, I think, or something. But like the first one that I actually gave a shit about and tried and was the last action hero. And I, that was when like started wearing like the chain around the neck, vintage rock tees, got like bought a pair of leather pants. First, they were shitty vinyl pants. Then I got an actual legit pair of leather pants, got the white leather jacket because of Axel in the, in the Paradise City video. Like I was yep, all yep. in. And so it was that period of my life. And I, I grew from like five six or something or five five to six two in like six months like it was like did you did you notice like other people women and men reacting to you or i guess boys and girls because you're in school like reacting to you differently like did 100 percent. Like, it, yeah, it was okay. like it was like an overnight like i went from this like sort of awkward weirdo chubby kid to like just like lengthened and all the baby fat like left 
and all of a sudden were, I was taller like than a, everyone. You like when I look at your old pictures with your long hair, uh, it looks yeah. like you're like very much like Brad Pitt, like a young Brad Pitt in the '90s. Like you're in very good shape. You're very lean. Like <laughs> I feel like girls probably in high school or I guess immediately started noticing you, and then dudes probably like they probably still didn't like you, but for a different reason. <laughs> for a different reason. Were... Yeah, it was it was it was it was definitely weird. But I was still a fucking weird kid, and I was like obsessed. I was like wearing leather pants and a white leather jacket to high school, like actually high school and i was going I, by i probably would have picked on you dude yeah I, and i had all these aliases like the first major one that was was bobby blastar was two r's but then i settled into tommy guns t-o-m-m-i-i-g-u-n-z i would sign everything t guns for a year in for a year of high school every paper was signed t like with the z, like the long z and i wouldn't take my sunglasses off ever in high school my nickname with amongst the teachers and kids was rockstar because I was such a pain in the ass. I wouldn't go by my real name and I wouldn't take off my sunglasses. So when I was like 15, this was like, I was just an obnoxious piece. And so that's the, that's the time period that it, like, I just remember being like, I'm going to do something different than these kids. I don't, I don't want to go to college and do that whole fucking thing. So what was the, what was the next step then? Cause I know, I know that you didn't go to college and I know that you came out here. Um, so what did that look like with school, with friends, with your parents? Like, was there convincing? Was it, and also, also like, when did you, did you never have any sort of like performance anxiety? Did you just like pick up singing one day and pick up a guitar and you're just like, I'm just going to try this out. And I don't care what people think. Cause it sounds like you really didn't care what people thought about anything. What I, what I remember is the big defining moment. And I'm going to send this interview to him because it's, because it matters to me. And he's my earliest, oldest mentor is there's a guy named Michael McKay and he uh, ran this company called John Robert Powers. Now, do you remember back in the day when we were kids and you'd go in the mall and there'd be like the kiosks where there'd be like talent scouts, like Barbizon and that stuff? They'd like, you'd go to talent school kind of thing. Yeah, you'd yeah. I think I remember seeing them, but I was just so, I was so disconnected from even understanding what those were. That would have been totally exactly your hometown too. Like there would have been that, that would have been the thing. They would have scouted a yeah. kid from like, not like the biggest city, right? That's exactly, that's exactly who the most of the people would sign up. They drive a few hours to classes and stuff. And it's a, it's an interesting program because it changed. Now they're called Seattle talent. But at the time I talked to him in a mall, just like this, it was Northgate mall. And I was, this was, I had the white leather jacket. I was full on in that phase. I had, the hair was long and I showed up to their, like their office. And, um, I remember, I was in the front, like in like little, their little like lobby area. And I was like leaning, like talking to the like receptionist girl. His name was Summer. She ended up being a friend of mine. And I was like leaning, like kind of flirting with her. And I was like 14. And Michael tells me that he looked through like the, you know, the door to see who was in the lobby. And he's like, who the fuck is this kid? Like who, like, who does this guy think he is? Like, what is this guy doing? And so I went in and everybody else is like mm. clean cut, the same age as me, but they look so much younger because I was six probably, foot two already. You look like kids. Yeah. And you probably I'm, look I was like the same six, height that I am now when I was 14. Yeah. Um, and so, and so like, they're all like doing their audition kind of meek. And I'm just like, I'm not that good, but I just have so much like, fuck all of you kind of energy uh that michael like he like was like we would like to like sign him to the program and you know try to teach him and all this and they like gave this contract to my dad my dad was like i'll sign this i'll sign this i won't sign this i'm not signing this but we'll sign this and and, and so and that was the deal and i went in and michael became a lifelong friend he became um my earliest mentor somebody that i learned a great deal from and somebody who i always had the most positive experiences of my life with and i'm still in touch with michael and and that was the guy that convinced me that, that I had some kind of like talent or something that I was going to, that I had something actual, like real to offer. And I, I did all their classes, I took all the commercial classes, all the, all the runway modeling, the print modeling, the commercial classes, like those, those old headshots that you see with the white leather jacket, that's all the shot there. So that was, that was the year. It was like that John Robert Powers, Michael McKay, that was the, uh, the turning point, so to speak. So it felt you felt like you had like an agent up there that believed in you so then it was like i'm gonna go he's like you should go to la or like where where did that because that's a massive step and the fact that you came down here when you were 18 is is kind of horrifying in my mind like i think about coming down here when i was 18 and you know i came down when i was um god i'm so old now it was 2010 so i was like you know 22 you know, yeah that's, that's like such a th those four years are massive you know like there's so much 
figuring out life for me it was like i went from like being kind of like I, like an athlete to kind of just a chubby gamer to like super depressed like getting into theater to deciding you know like i changed my whole life in that short amount of time yeah um what so how did you just you were like i'm just gonna do this i'm gonna go to la like were your parents horrified i mean your parents are usually pretty supportive but like how did this step actually happen and did you, did you and, and who did you take it with so there was this there was this idea that i had and it was probably around the time i was 15 that i was going to start taking classes at uh seattle central community college and running start and i wanted to graduate high school with a diploma in three years because there was it's actually much easier than people realize you can you can graduate yeah. in three years with a diploma like you don't it's, have to get a gbd it so weird in our society it's like not cool to graduate high school early and like just yeah. move on with your life like it, it's it's like looked at it almost as negatively as i feel like as a as a, someone that gets a ged later when they both are just like f fine you know what i mean yeah it's like what do you learn in high school actually nothing. yeah like, so literally nothing <laughs> <laughs> so like i i remember um there was this moment where i was like i would like to graduate a year early and then i want to move to la and and i and i well, actually that's not true i knew that i wanted to move and go do something so there was, I, there was a couple, there was a moment where I like looked into University of Texas at Austin. Um, and I remember that. And I remember, and then it was California. And it was going to be, I was going to come down to LA. So my dad came down here with me and we looked at a bunch of schools. I went out and looked at Cal, uh, not Cal Berkeley, the one out, um, the one in Tarzana, Cal Arts. I looked at Cal Arts. I looked at UCLA. I uh, looked at a couple different schools and uh, we kind of talked about it. And then, and then I remember hearing about the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And I don't remember how or why that was what I heard of. At the time, they were pretty, they were riding pretty high because Adrian Brody had been a graduate of their New York program and he had just won the Oscar. And this was, this was probably 2004. So he had so just won much it. about uh, AADA and AMDA at this time. Yep. The, you know, those were the two after high school or after college that, or, you know, in that time period, you were like, oh, these are, the, it was like that or like, Juilliard, you know, like those yeah. are the schools you kept hearing about is like now, I guess, like hot button words or keywords you would hear as a kid and be like, oh, wow, that's that's real. That's legitimate. Those two and then Rada in, in London was the one, the Royal Academy, and I think Fitum for fashion. Those were the four I remember. Yeah, everybody, so, mm -hmm. everybody I knew in L.A. or like that, that ended up being like the schools that everyone went to. If, they, if you weren't going to be like a university. And so I remember hearing about it and flying down for an audition. And it was expensive for a, I mean, it's a pure acting school. You're not going for any kind of, uh, you get college credit, but you're not going to do anything other than just performance. I think it was yeah. close to 20 grand a year. Um, wow. Something like that. Might have been like 16. And, and, this was, and this was like acting, not music at all. Like not even, not even was, AMDA, which is the music dramatic arts, I believe. Is what this was pure acting. acting. This was an acting yeah. school. Because I had, I mean, at that time, I considered myself more of an actor than anything else. Modeling was a total wow. byproduct of, I love movies the same way that when we still talk about them now, I have the exact same obsession with them that I have. And I loved all the actors and, and I used to do like monologues and scenes and write stuff. And like mm -hmm. all my teachers and everybody were like, you're really good. I mean, I got a, I got a scholarship to this place for almost half my tuition based on my audition. Um, wow. I flew down and I did two pieces. I did the Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, Alec Baldwin uh, speech, put that coffee down, yeah. which I think was totally wrong because I was like six, 16. Um, I did the good I, hunting speech in high school from Ron yeah. Williams talking about my wife dying of cancer and being in war. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. It it you, just go, you go with the stuff you like. I did that yeah. one and I did this other one that had been written by an acting coach of mine at the time named Tony. Wonderful woman who was great. She was really great to me. Um, and... Yeah, I flew down. I did the audition, and they offered me the scholarship. And so I decided I was going to move down. And I was a, uh, I was seventeen actually. I, I had just turned seventeen. I, I turned seventeen that summer in June, and then I, was I moved. Still playing like high school football. I had a girlfriend, like a, you know, like Salem, Oregon, like going and hitting up like Sherry's Diner and Applebee's and Friday nights. Like our lives were so radically different. Okay, so seventeen. You, yeah, keep going, keep going. Yeah, I'm 16 doing the auditions, trying to figure out, and, and I'm thinking maybe next year. And at the time, music had been happening. That was that was the thing. So music at the time was this. I was a singer in like kind of bad bands, like punk, kind of punk rock type of bands. And then, um, and then basically, I, I was like, I want to be able to sing actually. 
So I started seeing this vocal coach named Bruce Howard, Reverend Bruce Howard. This is another one of my early mentors. This is a guy that was so influential in my life. And he was a guy that had trained under Maestro David Kyle, who was he was the big Northwest vocal coach. So he trained Lane Staley from Allison Chains. He trained Chris Cornell when he needed to get his voice back. He trained uh, Jeff Tate from Queensryche. He had like Maestro was like a big fucking deal in the music community. And Bruce had been one of his top students. But Bruce was a, uh, up in Washington. In Seattle. And this is yeah. probably started when I was about 14 or 15. And Bruce was a weird guy. He was a kind of a recluse. He was a strange dude. I haven't talked to him in a long time. But he was a he really had strong opinions about singing. And he really loved the idea that I wanted to be able to sing like these guys. So I used to go once a week. And I did this for three years. I saw Bruce every week for three years. And I did like scales. Like I people would make fucking fun of me because my they could hear me screaming in my house. And I would do these exercises every day. And they were like, I, I probably still have the, the cassette tapes because we'd record my lesson and I'd have to go home and do that lesson all week. But it was all like that shit you'd imagine of like, you know, like me, 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 you know, like, a, and, and this is like, ah, like a crazy sound and shit. And so, and I was doing like Vakai and like Lutgen, all these like composers and like big operatic stuff. So he was like, you need to get a guitar because you need to have a bass songwriting ability if you really want to be able to do this. You, you need to at least understand how to write a song. And I wrote like my first or second song and I played it for him. And he was like, that's as much as you'll ever need uh, as a songwriter. He's like, that's, you, you have the basics. That's really good that you were able to do that. You know, don't give it up, but you don't need much more. You're a singer. And so I remember that was kind of going on in my life. That's and cool. that year that I moved. Yeah, totally. Because he was great. He was great. And, and I remember when I moved thinking like, I'm a singer. I, I can play guitar and you know, David and I performed a lot back then, but music wasn't like the thing yet. It wasn't, I wasn't going to go do it. Like I believed that I, that I had it though. So, I do have, so like, go ahead. Yeah. You were doing, you were doing acting lessons and you were doing voice lessons and stuff, but it, like every time I've ever spoken to you and every time I even, you know, have heard you tell stories or even right now, as you're telling this story, it has always felt like music was so much bigger in your life than acting ever was i just i i still don't understand quite like because it, it doesn't feel like you were pushing against music because you were clearly following the road of both of them it almost sounds like yeah. you were training more in music than you were in acting but like why why not lean more into music than acting at this time was it just because you were more interested in acting or do you think it was like what 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 exactly was it because like i i still and i'm so curious to find out when you decided that acting wasn't for you but like because spoiler alert for you guys that don't know but like why <laughs> from this point to that point like when did that shift change because again it, it really has always felt like music was your true love but that acting got you to la yeah i mean acting got me to la for sure i loved music i wrote these songs there was these first few songs i wrote from like when i was like 16 or something and, and david and i were in this little duo called ghost so i had long hair but i had gotten past the like I had gotten past the hair metal look. I was more wearing like flannel shirts and like kind of looking, it's kind of this like Dave Matthews vibe or something, but it still had, I still wore a chain around my neck. I was still kind of weird. I just looked fucking weird. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we used to play at coffee shops and stuff. And we recorded a three song EP called something. I don't remember what it was called now, but it had three songs. It was like the first three songs I had written. And none of them were particularly uh, good. Still in Seattle with David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is probably when I was 16. And it was just before I moved to LA. But for probably for being 15 or 16, they were probably pretty good. But they weren't good. Like, I wouldn't listen to them now and think they were good. Right. And I remember I got to LA and I was doing the thing at the acting school and it really wasn't for me. Like, that, I didn't, I didn't particularly like the experience. Mm. Um, I didn't enjoy the people very much. I thought it was all kind of I mean, you've been around a lot of actors. Actors can be kind of a pain in the ass, and you put a lot of them together. Yeah, especially they're very one. vain, very competitive. They can be super annoying, just annoying. Just like shut yeah. up, just shut the fuck up. Like, can we just do work? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and and yeah, really emotional, super yeah, like dramatic, yeah. and and you know, drama. It's a drama school, so like, yeah. I, I remember um, kind of being in L.A. and I yeah, I lived with these three kids. Uh, they were all probably a couple years older than me, but. I, there's four of us in a two bedroom. I shared a room oh, with a God. girl named Natasha who was, she was British and she was, she had a horrible eating disorder so much so that she was, she had to move back to, she had to move back to England. Um, she had to move back in the middle of the year. Cause she was going to she like, she was dying. She was like that bad. Wow. So she moves back. And I remember like I played music. I would, I would definitely play that year. 
my one memory, my one memory from that year, because I was in LA for about nine months that year, was I was working at this comic book store called Meltdown Comics. It just got torn down, actually. Um, and that was my job. I worked at a comic book store, and it was like under the table. And I ended up, this is a whole long story, a, a shoplifting a ton of comic books, basically. I wasn't, uh, and I wasn't then, even going to go there. I wasn't even going to yeah. go down that road, but I'm glad you touched on it. <laughs> Yeah, well, and then I re- but the, and then I returned yeah. everything I had shoplifted. I like brought it all back secretly because I had like this crisis of conscience. And then I told them that I had done it, and they fired me on the spot. And uh, which, of course, they would. But you know, sixteen-year-old, seventeen-year-old me was like, oh, I was honest, right? So yeah, good, for, good for you, though. That that's like that's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing yeah. to do. It was like a big lesson. So because I had I had I was a kind of a klepto when I was a kid. Like I had issues with it. Mm. Um, and so. There was this one day I was at the counter and uh, the, my bosses at the time were listening to my little three song album. It was my boss's wife. She was really sweet to me. And I had given her my little three song disc and she was listening to it on her computer, kind of in the other corner of the place. And she was listening I to it. stolen and... something out of her purse while she was listening <laughs> to it on the computer. <laughs> and she, and she uh, you know, she, she liked it. She was like, this is really good. But like, even at that age, I still had the mind to know that when someone says that to you, it's usually like they're being nice kind of. Right, right. So I remember this is, I think I've told you this story once before, but um, there was this band in the 80s called The Cult. And they were a really big band for a while. Uh, and the singer was Ian Asbury. And he uh, was, when The Doors did their revival in the 2000s and they toured, he was the guy that, that toured with The Doors to sing because Jim Morrison obviously had passed. Right. And Ian was a pretty legendary rock star, especially then because, again, we were much closer to the time. And he was a friend of theirs because it was Hollywood. And he, I didn't know who he was. And I was at the counter, the main counter. And I saw him talking to, to Hisami. And uh, he walks over. And I'm ringing him up and he says, I'm going to do a horrible accent, but he says to me, um, I was just listening to your stuff, mate. Uh, you've got real talent. If you stick with this and see through the bullshit, you'll make it. And wow. um, yeah, and Ian Asprey said that to me, I remember. And I was, I was like 17 and I didn't, I didn't know who he was. She told me after he left, that's who it was. And uh, the songs were very good. I mean, I know what the songs were. I, I, I found a copy of that the other day and listened to it. And it's, it's pretty bad, but it, but probably for like being the age I was, it probably had more going on that I realized or something like that. Or maybe he was just being nice. Who knows? But it still was one of those. That's like probably the most significant music memory from that year in L.A. But I played a bunch of open mics. I wrote songs. I mean, I, you know, I, I just didn't really have. And that's a, that's a jobs. big moment. Like that's a because because like, you know, you can say what you what you want about, you know, he, he could or could not say. I mean, we both know he could have just not said anything. Yeah. There's no reason for him to say anything. Unless, like the only thing it could be is like in that moment in Talladega Nights, he's like, I was high, Bobby. Hell, you coming first, second, third, coming fourth, you know, <laughs> like that type of thing. Yeah, I yeah, doubt yeah. that was it, you know. Um, okay, yeah. so so this is good. So now we're kind of getting the basis of you getting to L.A. And then, honestly, I kind of want to, because we're, 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 where are we at right now? We're at 20, so we're like halfway through. This is good. Yeah. So you're in L.A. Now I want to f- flash forward, I guess, like, 13 years basically or 14 yeah. or whatever however long it is to now to where we are now right yeah yeah 15 you know, years a lot older <laughs> lots changed a lot heavier a uh, <laughs> lot heavier lighter you know like worked at a lot of jobs done a lot of things yeah. relationships all that stuff um but now you're finally coming back to music for real it feels like like yeah. actually for the first time since you know you and i have been friends real friends because you know, we were friends when we worked at library, but like not really friends that much. To the I didn't know I never went to your shows. I never I've never seen you play music live other than when it's one on one hanging out or for your live show that you did during COVID. I'm yeah, yeah, that's I true, know. which is crazy to think about. Um, so like, you know, talk to talk to me and talk to us a little bit about like finding music again, because I think what's really interesting for people that don't know you well is that you always write your best stuff and you always remind me that like, you know, it makes sense that I write my best stuff when I go through like very, very large emotional, you know, mountains and valleys, good or bad, you know, whether I'm yeah. in love with someone or whether I'm heartbroken, um, you know, and obviously, you, you know, acting is, it sounded like it wasn't your thing when you first came out here. So, so talk, talk of now about like, music in your life because you heard you know we've all heard like you coming into it moving to la and meeting this guy and yeah pretty good and all all like the fun shit right 
yeah. exciting stuff. But now it's not that exciting anymore. I mean, it, it is in a different way. It's almost more exciting now than it was then because it's more real now. And like the investment in it and the, and the songs I'm hearing you put out and the music I'm hearing you play and the way I hear you sing, it just sounds much more mature than the stuff you were talking about. And I'm sure even to yeah. you when you tell me when you listen to your old stuff. So, so like talk a little bit about your relationship with music and why you think right now in, in your life, the hardest year of most people's adulthood, you know, when you talk yeah. about it as a whole, um, why are you back again? Why is music back? And how does it feel now to be writing great music and playing great music in a, in a, what feels like a very different way? Yeah. I mean, there's been three distinct moments in my life, I guess, maybe four, but really three that come to mind where I was kind of really going like, like music was something that I was putting a lot of energy into. I would say four. Cause like the stuff from when I was a kid, maybe there was a stuff when I first moved to LA the second time when I was 21, when I came back out here and I was fight the moon. I was in this band with David. We had had this album out and I was kind of doing like a, so, so I came here, uh, I did the thing with the school. school. I, I dropped out three weeks before the end of the year. Cause I like, didn't want to finish. And I was just a punk. My dad begged me not to, but I did anyway. Mm -hmm. And I moved back to Seattle and then I like worked for Nordstrom, like kind of grew up a little bit, got an apartment, the whole thing. Um, right, 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 right. And then when I was 21, I decided I was going to come back out here and try the acting thing as like a grown up. not I mean, 21, you're not a grown up, but more so than 17. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and I didn't have long hair anymore. And I was trying to a little more of like a traditional uh, approach. Um, so when I first moved here that year, music was like a big part of my life, Fight the Moon. I was doing, but I was playing all songs that David and I had written together and that we had released on that album. I didn't really have the like confidence yet of my own material that I wanted to just be a solo artist. And also there was this whole idea he was going to move here. We were going to really try to make a go of that band. I mean, Fight the Moon was something we, we'd spent a lot of time with. We really cared about that band. Yeah. And, and we loved that album. We thought we had really good songs. Um, so that kind of ended probably around like 2012, I'd say. To that, like after, I'd say a couple years, 2011 maybe. I worked at like an advertising uh, music house where I was trying to compose songs for commercials, like learn some stuff there. Oh, wow. Um, and then when I was like 25... 24, 25, went this big breakup with my ex-girlfriend, Elizabeth, which you remember. And I had this moment of inspiration. I met this, I met this girl named Molly she, Moore. She moved with you down to LA, right? Elizabeth did yeah. when you were 21? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we met like a month before I was going to move. And then she moved down here wow. with me. And we were together why, for almost four years. Why was she years. so willing? Yeah, which is amazing to think that you guys were together that long after really only knowing each other a month before moving here. But like, how did you convince Elizabeth to move down here? Or like, why did she want to come down here so badly? I mean, she was a year older than me, so she was 22, and I think we both, I think she liked the idea of an adventure. Um, I mean, you know, it was a really, like, we definitely fell in love. It was, like, it was intense, and it wasn't, I didn't, I don't think I realized that that's, like, what had happened right away, but I definitely realized that there was a big, there was a big connection. Um, mm -hmm. And I think she, want, I think she loved the idea of the adventure. She road tripped down here with me when I moved, I remember. She wasn't going to move, she didn't move oh, with okay. me. So I, we dated in Seattle for, like, four or five weeks, and then, she road trip down here with me and like a three or four day road trip, um, August of 2009. And then she went back to Seattle and we like kind of long distanced it, you know, thinking that maybe she would come out, but not really knowing. And then two months later, she, I, I think I flew to Seattle and we drove, we drove here from there and that was, and we moved her down here. And it was kind of when people talk about like the cliches of meeting people at certain points in your life. Right. Yeah. And this is like yeah. one of the most magnified blown out versions of like, I met this person a, a month before they moved to LA. And then literally if you look at your life and Elizabeth's life now and their trajectories, it is a hundred thousand percent different than what it would have been if you guys did not meet that month, which is hundred percent. Yeah. So we broke up, moved out and I, didn't immediately start writing stuff. Uh, music wasn't back in my life because that's the end of 2012. So 2013, I remember kind of started and I want to say, I don't remember if it was 13 or 14. feels like it was probably 13. It was like that next, it was like six months later. And I met this girl named Molly Moore, who's an artist in LA now. Um, she was then too, but she, I, I think I met her and I, I can't even really exactly remember how. I think it was like an online connection or something. Yeah, I didn't know her. How I'm trying to remember how you met Molly Moore. I think I reached out to her on Facebook, maybe because she just was like an artist, and I like didn't. Re I, I I think that honestly might have been it. And I oh yeah, I think it was. I think you just like reached out about like making music or something. 
something like that. And and yeah, so there was this whole story yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and I met her and I was going through this real moment of transition and I projected all of this like need to feel something onto this idea of this person who I had met like one time. So for about a month, yeah. for about a month's time, I was like thinking about and talking about this girl, Molly Moore, like just, just like the whole time I talked to you about it. Like every day every I was day, thinking about it all day, every day it was like, and then you, you just started writing. Like, <laughs> yeah. like you were like, I wrote a whole album. I was like, what? yeah. And like, I and was like, I'm pretty sure an album means a lot of songs. Yeah. Cause you know, I was like, what? Yeah. You wrote a whole album. You mean you wrote a couple songs? Like you wrote, you, you did it. The funny thing is about it. When I look back at it, those out, those songs, there was eight of them. Only two of them were actually about Molly Moore at all. The other ones were all about Elizabeth. They were all just breakup songs, but there was, right. I needed some, like I needed some like push or something like that. So that, uh, that was what happened. And so I wrote all this music and I, started performing for like friends and, and being like, what do you think? And, and I got like good responses and I had a lot of momentum. So I started playing with this guy, this drummer I knew, and we, uh, we got a rehearsal space and we played some, we played some shows. We played like the, the, the BAM festival was like the, it was like a full band oh, show. Yeah. If you remember that yeah. festival, yeah, I know you know, we, we played some stuff and we were, we were pretty good. The songs were pretty good. One of them I think is going to actually end up on this album that I'm doing so now. You were like what? 24, five around here is that probably right yeah now? this is like this is like seven years ago so yeah yeah i was 25 oh, okay okay and we and so we had just we had just like maybe started to hang out you and i were just buddies because i because i had that experience where i like met molly moore and got all inspired right around that same time that you had a big transition in your life yeah um a massive breakup yeah and so I wrote all this music and for about a year and change, I was really like seeking out some kind of meaning and music was helpful. Music was really helpful. And I loved all the songs I wrote, but it was sort of like the first time I'd ever written songs that I was really connected to. Like I wrote these songs and I really connected to what I was saying in these songs, but I had never done that before. I'd never like thought right. about how I wanted a song to feel when someone else listened to it. I'd never thought about it beyond like I'm writing this, and this is what I hear. So I'm going to sing it and write these words. And that's who I am as an artist. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, fuck off. Before before you were just trying to maybe like push what you thought sounded good, right? Is that more of like what it... Because like it is true when I, when, when I watch and listen to your music and how it evolves or like... Or even just your different moods when you're songwriting. Yeah. Like it is kind of... I, would, I don't want to say night and day, but there is like these types of songs. And then there's like the songs that have like so much more like you read it and you're like, Oh damn, Ben is like talking about a lot of stuff in here. You know, like how did like, you know what, you know what I'm saying? hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And I can, I can, that, that I can answer immediately. The, the stuff I wrote when I was a teenager was all fun and, and didn't have a lot behind it. Cause I had no life experience. The stuff that we wrote in fight the moon was all Frankenstein music. It was all trying to be mm. stapling together the best sounding melodies that we could. And then adding the best parts and keeping everything high energy and singing really high. And it was, Really, we wanted it to be like energetic and have so much dynamic quality that a lot of the actual reality of what we were trying to say in the songs got kind of lost. Right. And then like a showcase of your talents to be musicians as opposed to your showcase of talents, musicians singing the songs you wrote. Right. The stuff that I wrote when I was 25 is stuff I'm really proud of still. I love a lot of the parts and the bits in those songs, but there was still it was still so much inspiration that came from fight the moon in that era in my life that I think I didn't totally know how to do it. I didn't totally know how to do it differently. So a lot of the stuff I wrote still is singing more aggressively, higher than I really yeah. want to sing. Way, stuff like is, way higher, faster tempo. Right. And like, yeah, guitar parts that were depth. trying to be guitar parts that were trying to be really cool or different or interesting. And so, and so it was fun, but I just still remember when I like played live at BAM, I still remember thinking like, this didn't like this was well received, but like the people watching didn't receive this the way that I think I imagined they might. And I think that was when that was the period of my life that I really started to get like hooked on Tom Petty. Like I had grown up with Tom Petty. He was the guy that I listened to as a kid, but I started to think so much more in that time about his songs are so simple. He doesn't sing high. He doesn't push his voice. He just, writes these simple pop songs that are like kind of rock and roll and he has so many and the world loves them. They're all simple. And why do they work? And like, I, that really got me thinking, but the funny thing is I didn't have the breakthrough moment where I started writing stuff that felt to me more like that until recently. I don't know why 
I think it actually has more to do with just like having lived life. I think it's just getting to this point in my life now where I don't, I don't want to write a complicated guitar part for the sake of writing a complicated guitar part. I don't want to push my voice to be high. So somebody will be impressed that I can sing high. I want to write a lyric that I really distinctly connect to that. I believe the people listening to will understand what I'm saying and they'll connect to it too. And I want it to have power and dynamics. And I really want that to be the songs I'm writing so that when I play them for people, I can watch, like I can, I can feel it. Like they're getting what I'm saying. And when that doesn't happen right now, I don't like the song as much. So I gravitate towards those ones. So, you know, your, your live show was a pretty emotional thing. I think for you, it definitely was for me and I'm sure for probably other people that have kind of been with you along the way for so long. Yeah. Um, and I think a big part of it was just how happy you look playing music just because, it, you know, when you get older, it's really hard to find things that bring out that like true, genuine happiness. But, you know, when you played that show, how did it feel in, in comparison to like, you know, Bamfest or whatever? Like, how did, how did it feel in the sense of playing music to no one at yeah. all in your yeah. apartment, but then actually singing the way that you like the songs that you wrote that have real meaning to you. You know, I was, I just watched uh, walk the line and like one of my favorite lines in that movie is she's like talking about, she's like, you know, Johnny cash. She's like, what you're just like slow, like a train, but sharp, like a knife or something like that. Talking about the way he yeah. sings and talks. And he's like, he's just like, I sing as fast as I can essentially. Like that's as fast as the words come out. And it's so interesting, right? Because it's just like every single person has their very different styles of singing. And yeah. it really feels like this style that you're in now really complements you more because you still can hit those high notes and you still have a great voice. But I think this is, it doesn't feel like you're straining as hard to, to showcase your talents. It feels, yeah. To answer your question, that was the most rewarding performance experience in music I think I can remember having. Um, there's been a bunch of times I've played shows where I've liked it or I feel like I got a really great response. And I've played to, I've played to okay size crowds, never anything huge, but I mean, you know, I've played to 100, 200, 300 people a couple of times. And, a lot of people. and yeah, but, but this one, like every song felt easy. The whole experience felt easy. No part about it felt like there was no stress involved in any part of the show. And prob probably some of that was just having the best fans in the world. I mean, we have incredible fans. They're so supportive of what you and I do. And a lot of the people in there were those people. Um, but I think some of that is what you're talking about. It, I, I mean, who knows what will happen with it? I, I have a really good feeling about music right now. I like still, there's like this, like, I just have this feeling about it when I think about it every day. It somehow feels real and tangible, like it's actually happening as opposed to like, this thing that I might want to do someday or like something, some friend that's like, I'm a musician. I'm like, good luck with that. Like, it doesn't feel, I don't think of myself that way, but maybe that's just my head at my own ass, but, but it does feel, it has, it has energy. And I think that show was a pretty good, um, a pretty good expression of that energy. It felt exactly like the way I feel about music right now. Now, do you think you're going to just keep going down this rabbit hole? Cause it feels like, honestly, man, when you listen to just, I think if you go back and listen to these 42 minutes, I think what some people are going to think, or they're like, it feels like this dude has been battling being a musician his whole life, even though he's been a musician his whole life. You know what I mean? Like, it feels yeah. so, like, you know me. I'm like, if I don't book this role, I'm going to kill myself. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I'm so <laughs> yeah, into, yeah. like, I'm so committed and invested, which is why I have such high ups and lows and such like heartbreak with things that I should not even be invested in. And that's something yeah. that I need to, you know, I've gotten a little bit better with as I've gotten older, but you know, now that we are older and you've kind of come back around to music in a different way and I see it and I've watched for a long time in our friendship, I've watched you as a musician. It feels like, like is, it feels like there's actually a, a real future in this. Like, like you said, you don't feel like you're those guys. It's like, Oh, I want to be a musician, but you know, that's fine. I know that you don't want to go on the road again. I know you don't want to live out of a bus and I know you don't want to play in shitty bars yeah. all over the States and like sell your album. I know that's not what you want to do, but like you and I just wrote a pilot of our first show and we've talked yeah. a lot about like, it would be really cool to have great music in that show that people didn't know was yours till the credits rolled, you know? Yeah. And that's a way where people watch the, if, if let's say the show takes off and they hear that music that literally just blows your music career up to the next level without even trying, not, not, not without trying. We put in a lot of yeah. work, but not with aggressively pursuing music as a, like your profession. Like, is there a way for you to land on this? And if there is like, what does that look like to you? Because it feels like if you don't pursue music, 
you're not only depriving yourself, but you're depriving a lot of other people of a talent that you're not a, you're not an accountant right now. It's not like you're changing your life. You're in yeah. entertainment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what it feels like to me is, you know, I'm fortunate to have uh, obviously an old friend and David Michael Frank, who's a talented producer and he's somebody who's been helping me get this off the ground. And um, we're working on some stuff now. I have some other friends in LA as well that I'm also speaking to about kind of developing songs for this album. And um, step one is get some music recorded. I mean, I, I think I'm going in this weekend. This will air Friday. I, I think I'm, I think I have a session to do the first actual tracks uh, of the first song on the album the next day. So I think this Saturday I'll be putting the first parts down of the first song. And um, I'm trying to listen to like, I'm trying to like listen to like what's, you know, what people are making who are in sort of my genre right now and like really think about, and, and we're really trying to analyze like, what's the tempo? What are all the songs on the radio? Like what's the popular tempo that everybody's writing their songs at right now? You know, like, mm. is it, what's the production style? You know, like, is it, is there like lots of rock guitars? Is it, is there a snare drum? Like, and we're trying to think about that because I want, not only do I believe in the songs, but I think I want to make sure these songs, when they get listened to by someone, they sound modern. They sound like they're, they are right now songs. So, um, Step one is get the music recorded. After that, there's a lot of different places. I mean, there's all different platforms. You have everything from YouTube to Spotify. TikTok's a huge place for artists right now. That's a place that a lot of artists are blowing up. Um, and, and for me, I think I've had a lot of excitement about this. I've been a little nervous to play a lot of this stuff uh, for the whole world yet because I've gone through this extreme sadness and like really tough six months now to a year the last six months to a year have been like pretty rough and um you know it's there, there's just a lot of my actual life in these songs and it's Boy, uh it's incredible yeah and that's why the music's better that's why yeah. the music is better is because your songs now are personal and vulnerable and i think that that's a really interesting thing because you know you you in general are not a dude that wears his heart on his sleeve like i do um, yeah. And honestly, it's it's I think for most people, it's kind of hard to break through that first wall with you. And that's fine. That's the way people are. It feels like the music is really like a gateway into what's going on with your your life, whether it's depressing or not, whether it's inspiring, whether it's ups and downs, whatever it might be. Obviously, you went through a breakup recently and, yeah. you know, the breakup on top of the things that you're talking about, all of that being put into your music how does that feel in the sense like i know it says you you, you you said you're not playing it for the whole world but when is that going to happen and like <laughs> you know how do you think roxy's going to react to that how do you think people that are have known you for a long time but like don't actually know you and they're like oh damn ben was having just a harder time maybe even a harder time than i was in 2020 you know like is this going to feel liberating once it's done or do you think it's like are you are you still frightened of this moment or is it just like rip the bandit off where do you stand with this actual you know the context of your music yeah i mean i think i've gotten a lot more comfortable this last probably three months you know on the most i would say that probably the place that i'm speaking the most honestly about my life is on these out of these monday streams these nerds and suits streams and and they're kind of all about positivity and goal setting and i've started to open up in those streams a lot like and really speak about my successes and my failures and where I'm really struggling. And I, I think that that has started to get me a little more comfortable with the idea that, that it's okay. It's okay for the world to know your struggle. Um, and so I think that that's making me feel probably a little more comfortable about the art. Uh, as far as communicating about a breakup, about depression, you know, about my struggles and, and people hearing it. That's just being an artist. I've I probably have never done that before. And, and they're, you know, I've never had to experience or, or uh, go through that before. But um, soon, I think, is the answer. I mean, the goal is to have the first song. The goal is for the first song to come out in January. That's the plan. The plan is for the first song to come out in January, probably the second one to be February. I mean, because originally the album was going to be December, but there were some delays, obviously. And, and uh, But that would be the plan. I mean, I, I even like the idea of like a music video, I think would be cool. Yeah. You know, I think I'll probably play an album release show sometime in the spring, but I'd like to play one more probably in January or early February that kind of sets that up. Um, and yeah, I think that's the answer, man. And, and honestly, I'm well, still writing. 
Yeah, and the other thing is, it's like it's not like you're like CeeLo. You're not like I've been driving around town. Fuck you. Like that's not your music. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. like maybe Rox will listen to it one day and she'll be, you know, she'll be like, oh man, like I I know what he's talking about here. And and, and honestly, yeah. if she does tear up or whatever, I think that's a good thing. I think it's important that your music like affects people that are related, like it actually connects with. But at the same time, it's like you're not saying anything bad about people in your music. You're just being honest about yourself. And I think. Like you said, over the last few months, that's really opened up you and, and, you know, you're volunteering and you're writing more open music and it feels like you're being happier. So, yeah, man, I, I think the whole music path is uh, that's really what I wanted to talk to you about today, because honestly, I wanted to get a little bit of a backstory. But then I also want to just keep going down this road of music, because I think it's probably one of the coolest things about you. And I know you pretty damn well, you know. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. It's it's been a it's been a huge experience. That there's there's a lot of highs that have come from it so far. A lot of things that are just yeah, that just feel really meaningful. And and I do think I can feel like this last like I'd say probably month now, uh, maybe even as far as six weeks, but probably like this last month, I can feel myself starting to come out of the the darkness that has been this last year. Like even though we're still in COVID, which fucking sucks. It's awful. I can just feel on a day-to-day -day basis, I feel a little lighter, I feel a little more optimistic, I feel a little bit more like I can see, I can see ahead to the next thing. And I don't feel as like, just generally, just generally and genuinely like, I mean, there were just days I just didn't, I just wouldn't get up. I just didn't, couldn't get off the couch, like, pa like paralyzing depression. You're like panicking because like somebody's asking you a question. They want to like see you or talk to you. And you're just like, I I don't, want don't know how to tell you that I can't do that. It makes me so uncomfortable to even have you ask me that because I like don't want to open my eyes. Like that was like where I was about three months ago. And so it's nice to be in a place where I'm starting to feel like I can see the sun again. And, and, and I like I mean, the people in my life, even though it's not like everything is perfect, the closest people in my life are, are, are without me suggesting it are suggesting the same thing. So I think, I think it's real. I think, I think that is happening. Yeah, man. So. I, I think so. And <clears throat> I'm glad to hear it so weird it really did feel like this whole year was like a like a cocoon for all of us and we don't know if we come yeah. out a butterfly or just like like the movie cocoon uh, yeah. so all right so there's a handful of questions here it looks like from your uh, nerds and suits uh, supporters your patrons first one here yep. is jeff alterman call sign quiz show he says tom cruise may be amongst your favorite actors but who do you think could arguably be the best working actor today what qualities would you or what qualities would go into that classification for you that's a good question Good question. Yeah, I think um, best working actor today. It's hard to not just say it's Joaquin Phoenix. I mean, it feels like it just is. He feels yeah. like because I, I think I think D. Day Lewis is retired, and I honestly even feel like at this point I'm like a little over what he does. Now he could wow me on his next thing, yeah, but yeah, I know what you're saying. I feel like the last the last one, like I liked Phantom Thread, but I also was sort of just like I've like seen this before, like seen you do this enough times now. Joaquin's like a he he feels like he's at a at an all time level right now. He's probably the answer. I'll tell you the other guy that I really love is Jake Gyllenhaal. I I find I'm yeah. finding more and more in his career and his stuff as he's developing as an actor. I'm like more and more and more impressed with what he's able to pull off. So that's that's probably my two. Joaquin was never like identified as a thing, whereas like Gyllenhaal was, and I think that's always allowed Joaquin to be much more nuanced in his performances and like so different. Like you look at commonest to cash to joker and it's like what like what is this yeah I mean, obviously there's a lot in between but he's crazy yeah he's he's pretty amazing I, I, those are probably the easiest i mean that that's also, also feel like they're kind of like stock answers oh you know fucking who else actually and we've said we've talked about a million times brolin weren't you oh. no no i love brolin it's it's oh. christian bale's the other guy because you'd want to talk oh, about a guy yeah. who just yeah who just like year in and year out just continues to turn in like the best work mm -hmm. like it's probably honestly, it just, it's probably it just disappears completely. Like it's in, the first time we saw the Cheney yeah, trailer yeah. was just like, what? what? Yeah. Those uh, guys right. probably that's like my three. Yeah. John Lestrina. I unfortunately now associate Tom Petty with Ben. Thanks. Mm. What is it about Tom Petty that makes him your favorite? I know American Girl is your favorite, but what about top five? Love you guys. And also, I know this is the worst, but you got to tell him about your ticket, man. You got to tell him about your ticket. Which ticket Tom you have? Petty concert ticket. It's, oh, it's oh. one of the most like heartbreaking stories I think I've heard. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've told it a few times, but the, yeah, the gist of it is like I was supposed to go. I was going to go to the last show he ever played. 
Uh, my brother was in town. I'd grown up and you know, listening to greatest hits and wildflowers, which are the two big nineties albums. And, um, he, those were his CDs. And so we would listen to him on road trips. And so he was in town and he was playing at the bowl and we were like, let's go. And we were going to go and buy tickets. And he last minute, like kind of talked me out of it. You know, we shouldn't go because it doesn't matter, but he was like, you know, he'll be around. We'll see him another time. And that was actually legitimately the last show he ever played. And my favorite song is the last song he ever played. American Girl was what he closed the show with. Um, and so, yeah, I never got to see it, but I did have the experience the next year of getting to go see Fleetwood Mac with Mike Campbell mm -hmm. playing guitar for Fleetwood. And uh, they came out, they came out for the encore and, and Stevie Nicks, who was like Tom's like oldest friend. They were like best friends forever. Uh, they play the first chord of free fall and Mike Campbell plays it, and Stevie singing it. And there's this big, you know, video display with Petty up there. And that was a, it, it was definitely, yeah I mean, I, even now i like talk about I it know, I start you talk about it, i'm like <sighs> it like really yeah because it was it was just uh it was an intense very emotional moment so um so is it your favorite i think it was because i didn't realize how meaningful the songs had been when i was a kid and then as i got older i think i realized how they don't try hard they're not even remotely try hard they are just good there's mm -hmm. so many good songs and they're so fucking memorable and they're so like classic and timeless um and he like he like i said earlier he doesn't he doesn't push his voice really he doesn't like have a big range they're just simple so i think as i got older i realized that i liked more tom petty songs and connected to more tom petty songs than like almost like any other artist in the world um and the answer to top five is that's it's a tough one i mean i think for sure you know obviously american girl there's a bunch that have like over the years really crept. I think learning to fly is for sure a top five one for me. Mm. There's a song called uh, insider that he did with Stevie Nicks on hard promises. That's, that's a really, really fucking incredible song. Southern accents is another one. That's one of my favorites. And yeah, maybe probably something, maybe like the song wildflowers actually is, I don't know. I'm probably forgetting one, but he has uh, so many good ones. That's yeah. a good question there. Yeah. Uh, all right. So party J here. Artist Jesse Dawson, which artist influenced your love for music and what inspired you to come back to playing music and to make an album? Yeah, I mean, so the short answer is Tom Petty is the biggest influence, yeah. but the other ones who, um, the other ones who are really on my radar and like have been for a long time, um, the Goo Goo Dolls are a big one. A lot of you guys know that. Mm. Dashboard Confessional was like a huge, enormous influence on me when I was like 16, 17. And Massive. I've said this. Yeah, they they like Chris Caraba had this moment where he he was like the like the heartthrob acoustic singer in the early two thousands because he did MTV Unplugged. They did the first comeback of MP, MTV Unplugged, and he was the you know he was the guy. And what's funny about it is people think of him and that time as emo music. They like really they they just loop him in with all the other bands from that time period. All the other you know like I wish I could say like, what saves the day and like the, I, there's all these fucking bands from that time there there's so many of them talking about but i don't remember any of their names yeah yeah they're all from like the late 90s into the early 2000s and yeah. but if you go and you ask songwriters like especially acoustic songwriters who their influences are i think chris caraba and dashboard confessional had a bigger influence on modern songwriters than like almost anybody else any of his peers because he did so much with just an acoustic guitar he had such a powerful voice he didn't even write that many, like, he didn't, like, write hits, really. He had, like, two hits, like, two songs. Like, Vindicated from Spider-Man 2 was probably the biggest one, and then Hands Down was the other one. Those were, like, the two songs that people knew. But really, it's more just about the fact that he was so prolific and the way that he sang and, like, the way he played a guitar. So I think I probably took as much in influence from him, and then Dave Matthews would be the other one that I think mm. taught, I pretty much learned how to play guitar from Dave Yeah, Matthews. I mean, Dave Matthews is, like, a massive... Pacific Northwest influence, period, and then music yeah. in general. Uh, so Brandon Buckingham, call sign cashier, says, once things get better in 2021, what are your top three goals for the entire year? Well, I got a bunch. Um, <laughs> some of them are pretty personal. Uh, one of them, I think the biggest probably that relates to what we're talking about is to release this album. That's a huge one. I really yeah. want that to happen this next year. And I really, I believe I can, um, I'd like to get to a place in 2021 by the end of the year in like a healthy way where I've got like a balance of like fitness and diet and drinking and all that stuff together where I like, don't constantly feel like I have some 
like next step goal I'm trying to get to. Like I want to get to a yeah. place at the end of the year where I sort of feel like I've found a place of maintaining all that and it feels balanced, which I think is probably a bigger goal than I'm giving credit. But I like LA and being a person in this industry, as you know, you're so aware of it all the time. You're yeah. so aware of your age and you're so aware of your weight, you're so aware of your diet and your skin and all this shit. And it's like, Everything. I just want to feel, I just want to wake up in the morning and feel like I am treating my body in the way that it deserves to be treated. And I feel okay about it and I'm not stressed out about it. So that's, that's like a huge one for me. I'd like to get to. And then I think probably, I mean, I'll just go with the Schmodown one. Yeah. We'll yeah. just go with the Schmodown one. Cause I do think about it a lot. It's Lame. to end the year. With, <laughs> it's, it's to end the year with both titles with singles and teams. It's that's, wow. that's, that's the other one. All right. All so. right. Uh, last one here from Christopher Michael Woodburn. It's a two parter. I'm just going to read it in one. He says, what's up, Drew? Hope you're doing well, bro. Hey, thanks, man. I am. It says, and Ben, what's something embarrassing that's happened to you? Sorry, I had to ask, bro. LMAO. And in case you don't answer my previous question, then what's something you're <laughs> most terrified? So first, something embarrassing. And then second, if you want one of the two, one of the two uh, something that you're terrified of. What's something embarrassing that's happened? You probably could think of this better than I could, honestly. Yeah, uh, just you know, you never know. I mean, I, I think. What I, are you terrified of, though? Do you have do you have phobias of anything? Are you like? Because you know, I hate spiders, and I'm not good with heights. But like, I do you have something? I think I'm. I get like the real, fe the only like real, like scared of like the real, like fear thing that happens for me yeah. is it's the moment I, when you wake up and this sometimes even happens when I'm like stone cold sober, didn't drink the day before anything, but it most often happens after a night of heavy drinking. And it's when you wake up and it's like six in the morning, mm. five in the morning and you have this, I have this creeping sense of dread. Like I, yep. like like there's 30 things that I need to get done and I'm not going to be able to go back to sleep because I'm not going to be able to stop thinking about them. And there's no way I'm going to get them done. And I've already lost the ability to get them. Like it's this panic. It's this panic of, of not being able to actually get on top of the things in my life. And I find that that's the moment it's, it's, it's the hangover 5am moment that it hits the hardest. It sometimes just happens in my day to day. Like, just, oh yeah i mean there's like a meme of the existential dread like you don't need an, an alarm clock once you're in your 30s because you just get woken up by your existential dread every single day um, yeah i think it's probably something pretty similar <laughs> to that and then you add in the 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 fact that the drinking makes it so you can't really sleep through the night and uh that's a pretty rough 5 a.m yeah well man um I, I think that's it we're, we're at an hour we did it we got an interview in we got these questions in this is your show though so was there was it what else is did, did i do okay you did a great job, man. This was fun. This was fun. I hope you guys uh, watching this enjoyed this. A big, big shout out and appreciation to all the all the patrons, all the, the watcher supporters of what we do here on Nerds and Suits. And, uh, and a big thank you to Drew, obviously, for doing a great job conducting the interview. So I think uh, enjoy your weekend, everybody. Enjoy the Schmodown Spectacular. It's going to be an oh, epic, yeah. epic, epic event. Um, and otherwise, yeah, thanks to everybody for watching. Bye, guys. Guys, thank you so much for watching and for listening to another episode here of A Great Conversation on Nerds and Suits. I never get to do that type of thing, have those types of conversations, or even answer those types of questions, so that means a lot to me. Thank you guys for watching that. That uh, At the end of that, I really I felt like that was a cool thing I got to do, so a big thank you to Andrew Guy, and a huge thank you to all of my Double Diamond and Infinity patrons in the Nerd Network, Nicole Krafik, Chris Woodburn, Jack Mayer, Jack Yacoveta. I said Jack, what am I doing? Jake Yacoveta. Bartab, my guy. And of course, Jeremiah Morris, thank you guys so much for supporting at that level. Um, anybody here who watches the Monday stream knows I'm going to be doing these sort of one-on-one -on -one sessions for the holidays for all of the Diamond patrons at above. So if you're interested in doing that, be sure to send a message to me on patreon.com slash nerds and suits. Let me know. Uh, 15 minutes for all of the Diamond patrons. And I'll be doing 30 minutes one-on-one -on -one with all of the Double Diamond patrons. So uh, thank you guys for supporting what, uh, what we do here. Leave a comment on this video and of course hit that thumbs up button. If you haven't already hit subscribe, please do. And uh, above all else, guys, have a great holiday, and thank you so much for supporting what I'm doing here with Nerds and Suits. I'll see you guys next week.